Hello everyone and welcome to the 2020 hands-on demo for the introduction to flow cytometry course. In the past, this session has been held up in the flow cytometry core. This year, with the onset of COVID-19, we've opted for an approach that involved less interaction and less crowding around a single computer monitor. Today, we will be taking you through the steps of a flow cytometry experiment. At the end, a data set will be published in Blackboard, which you will analyze as a practice for your future experiments. With that, let's begin. The protocol that we will be going through today has five main steps. One, preparation of cells. Two, live dead staining. Three, FC blocking. Four, staining target markers. And finally, five, running the experiment on the cytometer. Before we started the video, we harvested splenocytes from a wild type mouse to use as an example for this experiment. We've plated these cells and washed once with PBS. We've labeled the 96 well V bottom plate as shown. As we look at our plate, please note that we have labeled the well for each individual compensation sample in our leftmost column. These will be single color controls. As well, We've also placed a multicolor sample, which we will be analyzing for our experiment up in the top right, labeled by the number 82. This is our mouse number. It is also important to note that we have an unstained control in the upper leftmost well. This will help us to correct for any potential autofluorescence in our cells. Once we have plated our cells, we need to label them with a viability dye, commonly abbreviated FVD for fixable viability dye. These amine-specific dyes cannot penetrate live cell membranes, but are capable of penetrating damaged membranes of dead cells to stain interior and exterior amines. This will result in a strong positive signal in the dead cells in our sample, allowing us to exclude them. We add viability dye at a concentration of 1 to 1000 in 1x PBS for this experiment. Since viability dye binds to amines, a protein-free medium is required to prevent the dye from being quenched, resulting in unlabeled cells. Once we've prepared our master mix, we add 100 microliters of this solution to our BV510 comp, as well as to our multicolored sample. Add 100 microliters of PBS to the other comp wells and mix. Once you've added the viability dye, set a timer for 20 minutes and stain on ice in the dark. Once the 20 minutes have elapsed, add 100 microliters to the plate to wash it and spin down. Once the spin is complete, flick the plate into the sink to discard the supernatant from all of the wells, leaving only our cell pellet behind. Repeat this wash by adding 200 microliters of PBS to each well and spinning down again. Now that we've labeled our cells with fixable viability dye, we need to block our cells next. Blocking prevents our cells from binding to the FC portion of the antibodies we will be using to label our cells. For this experiment, we will mix rat and mouse serum 1 to 1, and then that will be diluted 1 to 20 in 1x PBS to generate our blocking solution. This is a common setup for blocking mouse cells. Other blocking solutions may be more appropriate for different species, such as human cells. Once you've generated the blocking solution, add 50 microliters of it to each of the samples. The protocol we have provided also says to add 50 microliters of PBS to all of the comp wells, for this experiment, we actually added blocking solution and blocked the compensation samples, which is perfectly acceptable. Block on ice for 10 minutes in the dark. After the 10 minutes have elapsed, the block is complete. Wash the cells two times just as with the viability dye steps. Add 150 microliters of PBS, spin, and flick. Then repeat with 200 microliters of PBS in the second wash. Next, prepare the antibody cocktail for the samples. For this experiment, we're preparing an antibody cocktail with seven different antibodies, which are shown on your screen here. When making the antibody master mix, it can be helpful to make a small volume extra in order to ensure correct volumes are added into each well you are staining. In our protocol, we make a mix for one sample that is enough for 1.25 samples, even though only 1.0 volume will be used. Once the antibody master mix has been made, add 100 microliters of the antibody cocktail to each sample and mix well. Additionally, 
add 100 microliters of PBS to each of the comp wells on the plate, and mix thoroughly to resuspend the cells. Add the titer volume of each antibody to its appropriate well. Mix well after the addition to ensure optimal staining of the compensation controls. Put the cells on ice and set a timer for 30 minutes. After the 30 minutes has elapsed, wash the cells as before by adding 100 microliters of PBS to each well. Spin the plate, flick off the supernatant, and repeat. Once we have washed, our samples must be transferred into a vessel that works well with the cytometer we will be using. For many of you, this will be a standard fax tube. Other cytometers have the ability to run straight from the plate. While the cytometer we will be using in this example, the Attune NXT, works well with these small cluster tubes. Once the staining of our cells is complete, it's time to head to the flow cytometer. The Shapiro Lab uses the Attune NXT cytometer from Thermo Fisher Scientific. Although there are some differences between this machine and commonly used machines like the LSR2, many of the basic components are the same. If we open up the top of the Attune, you can see the filter set we use. Note that the filters and the detectors on the Attune follow a linear pattern rather than the octagon and trigon setups in the LSR. Also note that the Attune has four laser lines in a parallel configuration, violet, red, yellow, and blue. This configuration allows for many colors in a single panel. When we look at the sample intake, you can also see there is a sip, the metal piece that the liquid is taken up through, and a sample arm, which can be moved up and down. Before we show running on the machine, we need to briefly discuss the general protocol for running a sample. To start, grab the sample you wish to run. Briefly vortex the sample to ensure the cells are evenly distributed throughout the fluid, and then place it under the sip. Gently push up on the sample arm to put it into the correct place. When a sample is complete, gently pull down on the sample arm, wipe off the sip with a Kim wipe, and proceed to the next sample. Before we show samples and compensation controls being run on the machine, I want to take a moment to familiarize ourselves with the software. I apologize that the quality of these screen captures is not exactly high definition. Fortunately, I think the videos capture what they need to for the purpose that we're using them for. Each cytometer will have slightly different software. BD machines use a software called Diva, while the Attune has its own proprietary software. There are a number of similarities between the Attune software and Diva, and so understanding this layout will help you learn for another program. So taking a look at our software, on the left side is what we call our collection panel. This panel allows us to run samples, to record data, to change the collection speeds as well as the acquisition volumes. All of these are relevant settings that may need to be altered when we run our cells. On the right hand panel, is our instrument settings panel. So this panel allows us to change PMT voltages and edit parameters in our panel. Here you can see we have input the parameters of our panel into the software. Now that we are more familiar with the software, we'll begin to run our compensation samples and our unstained control. Before we record our compensation samples, we need to adjust the voltages of the machine to ensure that we don't have unnecessary spillover from one channel into another. To begin, we run an unstained control sample. You can see that I have generated a simple forward scatter, side scatter plot and gate in, order, uh, in the top left plot. Now we will begin to run our unstained control sample. The unstained control sample will help us set our forward scatter, side scatter voltages and will also help us correct for any autofluorescence in our samples after we conduct compensation in Flojo. Once I am satisfied with the forward scatter, side scatter parameters, and the cells seem to be roughly in the bottom left corner, or the lymphocytes seem to be roughly in the bottom left corner, I move on to my next compensation tube, which is BV785CD3. You can see that the BV785 plot has a strong peak centered around 10 to the 4th on the x-axis, but there is not a strong peak on any other channel in any of the other histograms. This is what we look for in every channel as we begin to set our voltages. For this sample, I will not change any voltages since it seems to look all right and the only main peak is in CD3 BV785. I will go ahead and stop collection and move on to the next tube. 
Next, I will run the APC size 7 single color compensation tube. You can see that this sample produces a strong peak in the APC Psi 7 channel, the top right histogram, as we would expect. But unlike the BB785 histogram, it also produces some strong peaks in other channels, like the PE Psi 7 channel, as well as the APC channel. You can see that they both have fairly large and uh, rather significant peaks. This is due to fluorescent spillover, and is why we need to conduct compensation. Here, we look to see if any of these off-target peaks have the same magnitude as the on-target APC Psi 7 peak. The PE Psi 7 parameter is too high for my comfort, so you can see that I'm turning down the voltage of the YL4 channel, which is the channel that PE Psi 7 is collected into. I will repeat this process for the remaining single color compensation controls, adjusting the voltages as necessary, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to show you each of those. Uh, but essentially it will run the exact same way as I've shown you in these first two. Either there will be just a single important peak on the, the on-target channel, like in BB785 that I showed, or I will have to adjust the voltages to ensure that the single color control has the strongest peak in the on-target channel, like I had to with the APC Psi 7 example. Now that we've set our voltages and feel comfortable about where they are, it's time to record our compensation controls. So previously we'd just been running, we hadn't been recording the data that we'd been collecting because we were just using it in order to change our voltages. Now we're going to be recording our compensation controls, which means we'll be saving the data. We start with the unstained control. The rule of thumb is to collect at least 5,000 events for each compensation control. But we recommend many more than that. I often collect tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of events in my compensation controls. And in my opinion, the more cells you can collect, the better. Once I have collected my unstained control, I will collect the BB785 control. You can see that when I select the sample on the right, it brings up a zoomed in version of just the CD3 BB785 parameter, as well as a new gate. This gate will allow me to gate, or a gate on the histogram. This gate will allow me to gate on the positive peak of this particular uh, cell marker, which will be used in the compensation matrix. Setting the gates is a bit subjective. Some people will set their gate over the entire positive population for a bimodal peak, as I show here, while others will just put the gate around the most positive events. The values used by the machine are calculated by taking the median of the cells within your gate. Once this sample has been collected and we decide on a gate location, we will repeat this process for the remainder of the single color compensation controls, which much like before, I will skip for the sake of time and will review in just a moment. So we fast forwarded here and now you can see that we have run all of our single color compensation controls, I will scroll through them here, and set the gate for the positive events in each of the samples. So you can see that each gate has a slightly different look to it, each peak has a slightly different look to it, and all of this is due to the biology of the expression of each of the markers that we're examining. So we wouldn't expect CD3 to look the same as CD11B, for instance. The, and collectively, this gating that we've done here allows the software to generate a compensation matrix, which will be used by our multicolor samples when we're running them. This will also be automatically applied in Flojo. However, oftentimes people will recompensate their cells after they, or samples after they have transferred them into Flojo, because oftentimes the machine generated compensation matrix is not as good as what Flojo can generate. Now that we've collected and recorded all of our single color compensation controls, it's time to move on to our multicolor sample. So as we take a look at our workspace for the multicolor sample, you can see that I've generated just a, a basic workspace with some basic gating for size, live cells here in the top middle, and then CD3 positive and negative events in the top right plot. To save space, I have not put a doublet exclusion gate in here, but that is something that should be added to your experiments, both while you're collecting the, the events as well as in Flojo afterward. Now that we've set up this basic setup, we'll run the sample and you can see that our populations have started showing up on the screen after our sample has started to run. 
rather than tell you everything about the gating that I've set up here and the gating that you'll need to do on the CD3 positive and negative events, I'll let you investigate that yourself with our data analysis assignment, which is available on Blackboard now. So now that our sample has finished running, we have run and recorded our compensation controls as well as our unstained control. We've also recorded our multicolor sample, and we're ready to export this data for analysis in an analysis software such as Flojo, FCS Express, or another. At this point, you can take yourself and dive into that data analysis with our data analysis assignment, which is available on Blackboard now. Or hopefully you've learned a little bit about the start to finish protocol of how to label cells and run the cells on a flow cytometer. We thank you for your attention and we hope to see you next week.